What's the fate of Highway 85? The groundbreaking's already begun, but Saratoga's putting up a roadblock. It's a new look for the Cupertino Civic Center. Earthquakes, are you prepared for the big one? And something's definitely in the air with Cupertino Parks and Recreation. All this and more on this edition of City Beat. City Beat, a half hour magazine show focusing on news and events from the city of Cupertino. Kermit the Frog here with some experts on clean air. Air pollution is easy to overlook. Even from up here. <laughs> I don't get it. Even though you can't see air pollution, it's still harmful. Oh. We the people must mount a campaign right to Washington. Huh? Me? No. Mm. To find out what you can do about air pollution, write to Kermit National Wildlife Federation, Washington, D.C., 20036. We, we care, care about clean air. air. Bully! If you haven't been by Torrey Avenue lately, then you might just be getting your first look at our new and improved Civic Center. This $5.1 million project consisted of major reconstruction to both City Hall and the Public Library, along with landscaping to the surrounding area. The facelift took more than a year to complete, and as Assistant City Engineer and Project Manager Travis Witten points out, it was no vacation. Oh, I, I think it was probably one of the more challenging projects for me. We normally are involved more in uh, street and utility work. Uh, we really don't do that many uh, buildings. The remodel itself added a great deal of difficulty for both the city and the contractor. And uh, it, it presented a, a large number of problems that had to be solved on a timely basis that were somewhat of a different nature than we normally would deal with. The major problem and concern from the very start of this project was one of space, or more accurately, the lack of space. Cupertino Public Library Administrator Marianne Wallace explains why. For the last few years before we did the remodeling, the building had been very, very overcrowded. We hadn't really used the basement area. We had used it for storage, for offices, for workrooms. And the entire public service area was on the main floor and the mezzanine. The main floor was divided into the adult section, the children's section, and the lobby and circulation checkout counter. And so each of those spaces only had about a third of the main floor. And then the mezzanine was adult and young adult. And in the end, we were almost having to remove a book from the shelves each time we added a new book. We were really very, very overcrowded. Our basic need was for more space for the collection and to be able to have more things directly accessible to the public. Cramp Quarters was also the same story next door at City Hall. Community Relations Officer Donna Cray. And it was mainly a space problem. The city was uh, unable to add more workers, uh, and the city was developing to a point where we did need to, to have more city workers, but we did not have the workspace available for them. I wasn't here at the time, but I understand that a committee was formed, um, and this committee, which was made up of city representatives worked with a consultant on space uh, management and it was determined at that time that we had 6,000 square feet of, off of space in the basement that was not being used. It was being used for storage and it seemed like a very good alternative to turn that into a usable workspace for the, the people working here at City Hall uh, and that's ultimately what happened. We went through actually several different designs before we came on this one. We started out with a much smaller addition uh, and really it evolved into this because we really wanted to make the best use of the octagonal building and we felt that with this layout we really used the public space to the best that we could. The main floor is now entirely adult and the mezzanine is adult and young adult and what we've done is add a 13,000 square foot addition out the back of the building and that's entirely administrative, lobby, circulation, checkout, workrooms, and storage. So that we've opened up the entire 24,000 square feet of the building for public service. We've also increased dramatically the uh, space that we have for the children's area, which is now downstairs in the basement. 
It's our lower level, our terrace level now. Dramatic improvements have also taken place at City Hall. When we started the project, the basement area of City Hall was basically four concrete walls, uh, a small employee's lounge, and primarily was used for storage of different documents. The uh, current improvement includes uh, office space for the building department, the planning department, the engineering department, uh, our cable TV people, and uh, our traffic computer operation for the signal interconnect. There's also a uh, employee's lounge, two conference rooms, an emergency operating center for the city, and storage, uh, bulk storage for the city clerk. The city was able to finance the estimated $5.1 million project through a tool called a Certificate of Participation, something similar to a bond. Under these Certificates of Participation, the city was able to package not only the city hall and library improvements, but also a third major project. Well, at this time, we're starting to work on the plans and specifications for the community center building, which will be located on the uh, existing orchard adjacent to Memorial Park uh, on Stelling uh, Road at Alves and Christensen. And if things go according to schedule at this time, it looks like we might be uh, under construction sometime around October. More on that project later. For City Beat, I'm Kellen Yamada. Coming up next, Cupertino asks, what's in a name? And Highway 85. Okay, kids, I'm here to teach you something really important, and you got to remember it, because I'm going to test you on it later. Now listen carefully, here we go. Drinking and driving don't mix. Did you hear what I said? Anybody who drinks alcohol should not drive a car. Nobody under any circumstance should drink and drive. It's dangerous and could cause a crash. I'm back with a pop quiz. Now, what were you supposed to remember? That's right. Drinking and driving don't mix. You passed. Now go see if your parents do. It's pretty easy to figure out how some cities got their names. Take a name like Mountain View, for instance. But what about a name like Cupertino, which is not so obvious? You'll see that the answer is embedded in over 200 years of history. According to research compiled by the California History Center, a Spanish expedition led by Don Juan Batista de Anza camped here on March 25, 1776. This land on the Monta Vista High School campus and the surrounding area was christened the Arroyo San Joseph Cupertino, after the patron saint of Copertino, Italy. Oddly enough, however, the name didn't catch on until around the turn of the century. Resident John T. Doyle shortened the name to just Cupertino and adopted it for his winery and houses along McClellan Road. By 1904, many popularized the name further by applying it to the post office, the general merchandise store, and the intersection of Sunnyvale, Saratoga Road and Stevens Creek Boulevard. And that's how Cupertino got its name. This is a familiar sight for most South Bay commuters. Rows and rows of traffic backed up for miles on our freeways, and it seems to get worse every day. Cupertino and its surrounding communities make up one of the largest and fastest growing metropolitan regions in the country. However, the present number of freeways cannot accommodate this growing population. Highways 280, 101, 880, and 237 are just not sufficient for handling the increasing flow of traffic. That's why county voters back in 1984 approved Measure A, a $900 million tax designed to improve conditions on the local freeways. Among the scheduled improvements is a proposal to extend Highway 85, which currently connects 101 in Mountain View with Stevens Creek Boulevard in Cupertino. Plans for extending the highway were first drafted in 1956 by the California State Highway Commission, but only recently have county officials acquired the necessary funds to support the project. The proposal calls for the extension of the freeway along the West Valley Corridor, thereby connecting it with the other major South Bay routes. 
Now, after more than 30 years in the books, it seems Highway 85 is at last becoming a reality. Groundbreaking ceremonies on the Cupertino stretch of the highway mark the official beginning of the long-delayed project, a project barring any further setbacks should see completion sometime by the early 1990s. Obviously, a, a freeway project of this magnitude is going to take an extremely long time to, to build. Uh, we're hoping that we can have uh, the facility open to traffic in the 1992-1993 time frame. For many, Highway 85 is a project long overdue. For years, San Jose area commuters have had to deal with the day-to-day -day congestion of the local freeway system. Arterial streets, particularly here in Cupertino, have also experienced a significant increase in commuter traffic. Traffic counts on De Anza Boulevard at Stevens Creek have risen nearly 70% since mid-May 1979. Other major Cupertino intersections have recorded similar increases. In fact, without a major change in the flow patterns of local traffic, these figures could very well double by the year 2000. From a countywide perspective, 85 is a real needed element. It's been in the plan for many years. It's been awaiting funding. Uh, our current uh, highways, 280, uh, 101, 17, are overcrowded today. There's some widening occurring on those roadways, but 85 is a real needed element for the countywide uh, traffic as, as far as future traffic projections and for our own local streets and some of the uh, commute traffic that uh, utilizes our streets, 85 will surely have some uh, effect. According to traffic studies like the 1987 Barton Ashman, Cupertinians can expect the following general improvements as a result of Highway 85's construction. Easier access to the freeway with Cupertino interchanges proposed at both Stevens Creek and De Anza Boulevards, moderate reductions in traffic flow along east to west running arterials, and a reduction in overall commute time for most county residents. Yet despite these optimistic predictions, there are still those who believe 85 is simply not the answer to the present traffic problem. I think that it, it's a major step uh, towards uh, continued Los Angelesization, that, that kind of uh, land use and that kind of uh, uh, trip patterns uh, between home and commute, uh, that it's going to uh, reinforce uh, long-distance commuting. It's going to tell people that it's uh, that we're trying to provide a way for you to live in Coyote Valley and have a job in, in Sunnyvale or Palo Alto or something like that. Also concerned with the issue are residents of Saratoga, a quiet upper middle class community of 30,000. For several years, the town has been strongly divided over the Highway 85 issue. In 1986, Saratogans voted against Measure B, an initiative which would have banned the construction of the freeway in their community. The measure was barely defeated by some 600 votes. Now it's 1988 and opponents of 85 are still trying to stop the freeway for the same reasons. Well, basically this road is being built for the residents of Almaden and Coyote to take the people from their residences to their jobs. Their jobs are not in Los Gatos, their jobs are not in Saratoga. However, they need to cut through Saratoga and Los Gatos to get to those jobs. And it likely has been the continued pressure from these opposition groups that has delayed the progress of the freeway in Saratoga. At a city meeting last March, Saratoga council members voted unanimously against the construction of interchanges within the Saratoga city limits. Only when proponents of 85 protested the decision did the council agree to take the issue to the November ballot. The community of Saratoga has clearly said yes to the freeway. It is less clear whether they also said yes to interchanges. And what my council is saying as a group is that we're not willing to make that decision without going back to the voters. All agree, however, what Saratogans should ultimately decide at the polls will have a profound impact on traffic patterns here in Cupertino. As I read the study, I think there could be no disagreement that if Saratoga takes an interchange within its city limits, that the level of service at the interchanges in Cupertino will be vastly improved. Or you could state it conversely, if we refuse to take an interchange in Saratoga, the level of service at Rainbow and Saratoga Sunnyvale Road will be level E or level F, which is gridlock at the PM peak hour. And that's, from my own personal perspective, an undesirable thing. It, may, it will have a great impact on our community because most of the traffic then must come to that interchange and what we're doing is concentrating all the traffic to one interchange rather than dispersing that traffic 
to several interchanges along the corridor. To complicate matters, the Protect Our Environment Coalition, now known as Protect Our Valley, has taken the state of California to court, claiming the Route 85 environmental impact statement to be both misleading and inaccurate. Pending the outcome of the lawsuit, the group continues to rally support against the Saratoga interchange measure scheduled for this November's election. Cupertinians, meanwhile, can only sit and wait, waiting to see how the debate in Saratoga will ultimately affect the future of Highway 85 in their community. For City Beat, I'm Pete Coglanese. When we return, we'll take a look at how the Public Safety Commission is educating you about earthquake preparedness, sounding off about the Pacifica McClellan De Anza Boulevard intersection, and Air Band Contest 88 at Kennedy Junior High. Have you lost your head? That's what I'm trying to avoid, my friend. But Vince, if we don't belly up to the bullseye, how else can we prove that safety belts save lives? Oh, it ain't working, Larry. Nobody's listening. Sure they are. Look at them. They're buckled up. Hey. Them too. So maybe eating all these dashboard hors d'oeuvres is worth it. For sure. Hey, let's head back. Hey, buddy, I didn't know you knew how to drive. Drive? Drive? Whoa! You could learn a lot from a dummy. Look at your safety belt. I'm a strapping young fellow, and I feel pretty good. So why am I getting my blood pressure checked? Because you can feel okay and still have high blood pressure. A test like this gives you a chance to find out and control it before it causes kidney problems, heart failure, or stroke. I figure it's worth a half minute or so to prevent that kind of trouble. You're fine. Hold it. My nails aren't ready. I like to fill every moment. Ow. For more information, write the Will Rogers Institute, White Plains, New York. What would you do if a major earthquake hit Cupertino? That was the topic of discussion at a special Public Safety Commission meeting held April 14th at Cupertino City Hall. Residents from Cupertino and the surrounding area attended the meeting, which included a special work folder study, an earthquake preparedness video, and question and answer session. The meeting was promoted in conjunction with the observance of April as Earthquake Preparedness Month, proclaimed by Cupertino Mayor John Gatto at a recent city council meeting. The public safety meeting marks the first step in a program of long-term earthquake education for Cupertino residents. This is a pilot project and it is uh, unique because we do a lot of follow-up. This particular commission has already made five presentations to Cupertino neighborhoods and we hope to be able to eventually reach five, um, 1,000 homes in Cupertino. Among the topics of discussion at the April meeting included the many preventive measures Cupertino residents can take to prepare themselves, their families, and their homes from the catastrophic effects of a major quake. Uh, we're going to locate our um, meter outside, and it's on the side of the house most often, and uh, make sure that you place a wrench close by and learn the on and off directions for uh, shutting off that gas. Other topics included structural safety, how to prevent fires, injuries, first aid, and what to do to survive in the aftermath of a severe earthquake. The Cupertino Public Safety Commission will be more than happy to send you a free information kit dealing with earthquake preparedness. Just right, Earthquake Preparedness Project, Care of the Cupertino Public Safety Commission, City of Cupertino, 10300 Torrey Avenue, Cupertino, California, 95014. City Hall has received numerous comments and complaints about the realignment of McClellan Boulevard and Pacifica Drive with De Anza Boulevard via the sound off cards in the Cupertino scene. Here's one such letter that we recently received. I can't believe the traffic mess at McClellan and De Anza. Incorporating Pacifica with an important street was a mistake. It was better the old way. And why won't you allow a U-turn from De Anza Boulevard northbound to southbound? The realignment of McClellan and Pacifica with De Anza Boulevard was necessary in order to meet the traffic demands for the future town center development while at the same time maintaining a minimum level of service along De Anza Boulevard. 
As a matter of fact, the present alignment is actually more efficient than the two T intersections that previously existed. As for the question about restricting U-turns from De Anza northbound to southbound, we should note that this intersection is under state jurisdiction. The Public Works Department is currently negotiating with the state to allow a U-turn on De Anza, but so far the state has said no. We'll let you know if any turn of events on this issue takes place. The Cupertino Parks and Recreation Department recently sponsored air band contests at two Cupertino Junior High Schools. It's like miming something. It's like a mime. You know? A mimic, not a mime. Yeah, a mimic. You know, you're, you're doing something, but not really doing anything. So when they're, where there's a band, they're playing instruments that aren't really there. It gives so the kids a chance air. to be like their favorite band. Yeah, they can act out their little fantasies. We did it last year for the first time. That was our first one and earlier in this school year. We did um, just a performance to remind the kids of how great we are. And we did that. And then this is our second one, our second one actually for the kids. They're really excited after they see us do it. When they see us do it, they're really excited and they want to do it because they want, you know, they want to, you know, just go out there and do something. And then by Monday, you know, half of them get scared and chicken out. <laughs> and then just, you know, just the diehards hang on and, you know, they just get together and, you know, I guess it would take them about two hours, you know, to really think of something up. And then it'll take them about four days to get it together. So it's just, you know, the excitement level just rises up really high and then comes down and then, they get psyched up again for the performance. Even though the groups had little time to prepare for the auditions, several groups had already practiced all of their steps. Other groups weren't quite sure what they were going to do. It's a very difficult task telling kids that they can't participate, but that's the way it goes sometimes here in the real world at Cupertino Parks and Rec Department. Thank you. Judging was based on originality, enthusiasm, lip sync, and costumes. Five lucky bands were selected for the finals and the chance to win a Rainbow Records gift certificate. This first band is Tony Basil and they're band number one. This is for old Mickey.
The Cupertino Parks and Recreation Department sponsors a wide range of activities for people of all ages. So give them a call at 253-2060 and find out what activities they have to offer you. Reporting for City Beat, this is Doug Michelson. We'd like to know what you're thinking about Cupertino. Write in with comments or suggestions for programming you'd like to see on this channel. Send all correspondence to Program Director, Municipal Channel 53, City of Cupertino, 10300 Torrey Avenue, Cupertino, California, 95014. Thanks for watching City Beat, and now we'll close with signs that spring has finally arrived at the new Hoover Park.